when it comes to homeschooling, there is no perfect. There's never going to be a perfect homeschool. Why? Because we have imperfect people uh, teaching imperfect children in an imperfect world. As long as we're learning, then we're growing. So even if we have a bad situation, like, like even after 20 some years of homeschooling, we still have misses and fails. And don't get caught up in catering to your insecurities or your fears that you're not doing enough or the curriculum's not enough or those type of things. But when you homeschool, you're breaking convention. You're going against the grain. And one of the things you'll notice is that suddenly everybody around you is an expert. And I think sometimes there's good, it's good to seek the advice of somebody who's actually been there. I know the price that we pay, but I know that it's worth it. And I don't believe homeschooling saves anybody. It's not a salvation, but it's a head start. It's better than the alternative. And so whatever the sacrifice is for me as a parent, I'm willing to pay it, and I'm encouraging others to pay that price too. Okay, so let's talk about um, new to homeschooling, surviving uh, your first year of homeschooling. And these are some of the tips that I would have if I was working with a new family um, that, uh, you know, if you, if you started homeschooling and you wanted to know what are my three tips that I would give, these are the three tips. The first tip would be to allow room for growth. That uh, when it comes to homeschooling, there is no perfect. There's never going to be a perfect homeschool. Why? Because we have imperfect people uh, teaching imperfect children in an imperfect world. And so it's always, it's always a moving target. And we have to be comfortable with, especially if you struggle with being a perfectionist and perfectionism, we have to be careful not to allow our insecurities and our fears and um, all of that to create in us this nonstop torment. Am I doing it right? Am I doing enough? Is, is, am I ruining my kids? All of those type of things. And we just need to center ourselves with, okay, we're not the first people to homeschool. Other people have homeschooled. They're obviously not perfect people. Their kids aren't perfect and they live in the same imperfect world as we do. Good. So now that we've established that, we know we're going to have an imperfect homeschool just like they have an imperfect homeschool. We're going to have some wins, we're going to have some losses, and we're going to have some draws. And let's set our mindset to not every day is going to be a good day. Some days are going to be bad days, right? That's life. 50%. I have 50% good days, I have 50% bad days. If I have an expectation that that happens, I don't... Um, I don't melt down when the world doesn't go my way and I suddenly have a bad, um, uh, a bad day because I'm almost like at the place where I expect it to be a bad day. So uh, from that standpoint, let's, we just have realistic expectations and we drop this thing of perfectionism. But remember, the mindset going into the first year is there is room for growth. So as we step into the first day of homeschooling, until the day we graduate our kids, there's always going to be room for growth. And as long as I keep that mindset, now watch, somebody will do a, a, a marketing, uh, a, a homeschool seminar, and they're going to name it Room for Growth, and that's okay. That's, that's what we need to have, right, so that we have a healthy uh, mindset going into it. Otherwise, we'll go insane. We really will, because we keep trying to think we're going to have... Um, we're going to have this perfect, idyllic uh, situation, and it doesn't happen that way. So number one, allow yourself room for growth. You're not perfect. Perfect doesn't exist, but we're working, and we're always learning. And as long as we're learning, then we're growing. So even if we have a bad situation, like, like even after 20-some years of homeschooling, we still have misses and fails. And so from that standpoint, it's like, okay, what are we learning? This isn't working. This is why I think it's not working. How can we fix it? And our dynamics are always changing. 
we were homeschooling six and we were homeschooling five. Now we're homeschooling four. Kristen gets breast cancer. Um, different things happen all the time. And so as dynamics change, we move over the, um, you know, we have to change the, the target changes and we have to change with it. And we're always a work in progress. So, and we all are works in progress anyways. So that's number one. Number two, my recommendation to a new homeschooler to survive the year, to love your kids and to love yourself is kiss. Keep it simple, stupid, whatever, whatever you want to use there. Keep it simple. We have this, you come into the homeschooling movement and it's like, wow, everybody has an opinion. Every curriculum is more amazing than the last curriculum. I want my kids to do classical, but I want them to do Charlotte Mason, and I want them to do traditional. I want them to do the five electives that this company offers because they're all amazing. And so we're gonna try to do 10 courses this year. I know it's unrealistic, but my kid is smarter than most. I think we can do it. And so we just keep adding on and adding on and adding on in layers of complication. Pretty quick into the game, we feel like a failure because there's no way we can keep it up. And so we have to, we have to um, just keep it simple. Do the basics. You can always add on that, but take a piece of paper and figure out, okay, what are the basics? I need to homeschool. I'm gonna homeschool 180 days, 36 weeks. Um, I need to make sure that I've got the basics covered. Now we do a basic four because of this. I wanna make sure I have my math, my language, my history, and my science. These are my basics. Now, you wanna make sure you go to hslda.org, click on your state, because some states are gonna require health, some states are gonna require um, you know, state history or, or certain fire safety and stuff like that. So you wanna make sure you also have anything that's required like that. And then go ahead and um, uh, write out, okay, what am I gonna do for math? What am I going to do for, for language? What am I going to do for history? Now, again, I may see three or four amazing curriculums and I want to do them all. My kid would love to do them all. Most kids don't love to do them all. Choose the best one and, and use that. And my suggestion for that is to go with more of an open and go solution. The easier a, a, a curriculum is to implement in your first year. If you have to do a lot of creating, a lot of going to Google and looking things up and stuff like that, it's really not going to be, it's going to be harder for you. So you want to do a curriculum that to kind of lifts the, the burden a little bit of teaching and, and the handholding. The other thing is, it's real easy because, you know, after we've homeschooled a year, we're all experts, right? So when a newbie comes in, we all can't wait to share the knowledge and you need to try this and you need to do this and we need to go to co-op and we need to run track and we need to, you know, we need to go on field trips and we need to do all these things. And pretty soon, again, you've filled it in so that there's no capacity, no room for margin, so that when something happens, uh, you can pull back and you burn out really quick. So the number two tip as far as keeping it simple is do the basics and don't get caught up in catering to your insecurities or your fears that you're not doing enough or the curriculum's not enough or those type of things. Find the basic, um, you know, here's what we're gonna do, here's what we need to do, here's 180 days to do it, let's just work at getting it done. And if you miss a day, then you just catch it up on the end or you double up as you go. But the simpler you keep things, the easier it is to manage. Uh, same with systems. Right? Some people are like, oh, we, we just like kind of winging it and, and, and that for our family, we have a place where we do school. We have a school room. Uh, the kids have a place where they keep their school books. We have a place where we keep the score keys and a place where they put their completed work. Uh, and we start school at a set time. Lunch is at a set time. Um, we end the day at a set time. And we do that because, again, that gives us some, some margin. So when we're busy, the kids know what does their schedule say. 
it's it's one o'clock. Why are you downstairs? The school started back after lunch at one o'clock. You should be at your desk working. It's very easy. We don't have to have this fight every day of, no, I'm almost done with my work. Can I just stay down 15 minutes longer? That's all draining on a parent. And so the more we can manage with um, systems, I think it makes life a lot easier. And I'm not a big systems person. I'm a big outside the box person. But I do think that systems help us manage when we can't, okay? So number one was room for growth. Perfection is impossible. It's a moving target. So just accept the reality of you are not perfect, your homeschool is not perfect, etc. Number two, keep it simple. Don't get caught up in I need everything, I'll do everything. We got time. We got time. You can add things. You can, you can, you know, maybe there's going to be a change that comes, whatever. You got time to try new things, to experiment. It all doesn't need to be done in the first year. Number three, I would say um, get used to the noise. When you homeschool, now after, after this virus and people are all moving kind of into the homeschool movement, but when you homeschool, you're breaking convention. You're going against the grain. And one of the things you'll notice is that suddenly everybody around you is an expert. Your mother-in-law, your father, your sister and brother, the football coach, the, the guy who's washing cars. They're now an, all an expert. They know more about how to raise your kids and homeschool and educate your children than you do apparently because they'll all offer you advice. And you can go insane worrying about what people and what the noise all is around you. And my advice is learn to live with the noise. Learn, learn boundaries. If you've never read the Boundaries book, I highly recommend it by Henry Cloud. Um, it's a great book to read, to learn how to set boundaries for yourself and for your family. But think of it this way. In my, my yard, um, there's a boundary. It's where I mow. It's what I tend to. It's where I try to keep order. Okay, so I have my family in my boundary and my house and my possessions and all of that is within the boundaries of my property. Now imagine if somebody else kept coming into my boundary, into my property, and then started trying to take possession of what belongs in my boundary. Well, obviously that's gonna cause problems. So what happens? We, we tell them, excuse me, this is my boundary. Like you crossed the line, you left, your, you left your property, you stepped into my property, and now you've got your nose in my business. So you need to take two steps back because you're in my zone. This is, this is mine to manage, you go manage yours. Now, you don't have to be rude about it, but you do want to understand what are the boundaries that, um, that I have that, you know, this is, this is mine to manage. Homeschooling is on my property. If you step into my property and start telling me um, how I should homeschool and, and, and what I'm doing wrong and I need to put my kids in public school, you have stepped onto my across my line and you need to take two steps back um, because that's none of your business. This is on my property now. Uh, sometimes people mean well. A mother-in-law, father-in-law, um, you know, father, mother can be sometimes the harshest critic. Sometimes they're embarrassed to say, my kid's homeschool. Um, <laughs> again, you had the opportunity to raise your children. Now you're a grandparent and I'm the parent. And so you can either respect that um, or not, but you're going to move off my property onto your property, right? It's time to, it's time to get back to your property. And um, I will respect your property line. I'll ask you to respect my property line. Now, some people may not like it because some people, they may be holding parties in your property. They may have been, they may be sleeping in the house, driving your car, um, using your kids to do their chores. You know, they're doing everything on your property. And so when you suddenly say, this is my property, sometimes people can get upset with that. Well, that's theirs to deal with because at the end of the day, who's accountable for the property you've been given? God has given you the stewardship of that property. And so you have responsibility for the property you've been given. And so if you've stepped onto my property um, and, and you're starting to dictate what needs to happen on my property, you're not accountable for that. 
And when I stand before the Lord God Almighty and I give an account for my life, I'm not going to be able to say, yeah, but so-and-so told me that I shouldn't be doing this. And so-and-so told me I should be doing this differently. And um, I need to, to be in a place where I understand healthy boundaries and I can very nicely say, that really isn't any of your business. That isn't really any concern of yours. I appreciate the fact that you're concerned and I appreciate the fact that, um, that, that you know, you care about us, but we're, we feel called to do this and we're doing this. We're going to make some mistakes. We learn from our mistakes. Very few people learn when they're not making mistakes. So we're going to learn and we've given ourselves room to grow into this position. And we ask that you do the same. It might be hard, mom, dad, might be hard for you to stand on the sidelines and watch this, but these are our mistakes to make. And as a father who has launched five kids, um, it is hard. It's hard to let your kids go and, and make mistakes. It's the hardest thing in the world to, make, to see them making mistakes. So what I would encourage um, you to do is understand, say, I, hey, I get it, it's hard. This isn't easy for anybody, but this is what we're called to do and this is what we're gonna do. So um, getting used to the noise and having some boundaries. The other thing I'll say in homeschooling, and I, I think it's, it bears noting, the noise has gone up significantly. And what I mean by that is everybody now is an expert. There are YouTubers and bloggers and um, Instagrammies and, and Facebookers and people who all have this grand experience in how to homeschool. Now, they've, they, they've never homeschooled beyond sixth grade or seventh grade, but they're, they're telling you that this is, you know, wow, this is how it goes. Or maybe they're even the experts and they don't, they don't even have fruit that shows that they're getting it right. I think it bears to make sure that the counsel that you have is solid counsel. Anybody can start a YouTube channel or um, a Facebook group or an Instagram page and suddenly start reviewing curriculum and they're the experts. The hard part about that is what is their experience? Is it just their preferences? Is it their opinions? But what experience do they have? Have they actually graduated students? Have they actually had any peer reviewing materials? Uh, you know, we just have to be careful because it's so easy to just kind of be following the noise and not actually stepping back and saying, but wait a minute, what, what qualifies you to speak into my life? Because that's something that we do even with authors. We ask, one of the questions I ask when they bring us a project is, what qualifies you to write this project so that anybody should give you their time? Because if it's just an opinion or I want to tell the world, but I don't have something behind me to back up what I'm saying, experience or something, then um, people can be easily misled. When I had only elementary age students, I had certain opinions about fatherhood. Now that I've launched five and I have teenagers and all my kids are a little bit older, my opinions have changed significantly because I realized that not everything I thought knew or even about education down here with elementary uh, was, was correct. Or, or even that I applied generally across the board. I didn't understand everything. The older we get, sometimes the more we realize, the less we know. You hear older people say, the, the older I get, the less I know. Um, it's so true. And I think sometimes there's good, it's good to seek the advice of somebody who's actually been there or at least look for that in the middle of the noise. Man, there is so much. I can't even imagine coming into homeschool and being like, I want to homeschool my fifth grader. And you type that into a search and you could just get lost in information. And I'm sure some of you are there. It's why with this group and, and the Moms and Master Books and, and the teaching tips, it's why we try to provide some extra assistance because we know how easy it was to get lost when there was a lot less noise and now there's a lot more noise. And, um, and anything we can do to help, we want to be part of that process. Uh, your first year homeschooling, those are my three tips. Uh, get used to the noise, keep it simple, and room for growth. 
And I just say, as I end, um, your first year of homeschooling could be really difficult. It's just because your family is getting used to all new dynamics. You're getting used to having your kids in your grill 24-7. Um, you're having to set boundaries with family members. Uh, you're having to, you know, fail and pick yourself back up and motivate yourself. You're having to give of yourself. It's sometimes hard, right? I mean, our kids require just an awful amount of attention and self-sacrifice to do it. And so um, I, you just got to kind of prepare yourself. Okay, this, this may not be easy every single day. But one thing I will say after 20 plus years of homeschooling and seeing families homeschooling successfully is I can't think of a better way. Like, trust me, if you will fight the fight and endure your, you know, run the race, you will see a fruit. Now, some kids still have to do their thing and all of that. I get that. But man, the benefits that we have of being able to disciple our children, to plant seeds, um, I've watched time and time again the alternative. And even in pastoring, and it sounds dramatic, but even in pastoring, having to stand besides the grave of a family who had um, gone a different way and tried to comfort the family when you remember the decisions that were made, uh, you know, it's just rough. And so uh, why I'm a strong advocate, I have, I have a story in my past of, I was a principal of a school and there was my, my daughter, my oldest, and there was another young girl who was her best friend. And we both, I stopped being the principal of the school and took another career. And my daughter, we pulled her to homeschool. And this other family, we asked them, boy, would you ever consider homeschooling too? And they said, no, we're gonna put them in public school. We can keep an eye on things. We got this, we know everybody. They're all good people, it's, it's, it's awesome. The trajectory of these girls' lives, watching the trajectory of my daughter, you know, in elementary it wasn't that dramatic. In junior high, you started to see the difference. And then in high school, it was like a world apart. And now as adults, it's just, it's heartbreaking. The things we've had to watch this beautiful, sweet girl go through and the things that she was exposed to and the pain that she suffered and the bullying and all of these things that led to where she is as an adult. And it's because of that that I have... Um, my mantra is, I'm not going to have the blood of anybody else on my hands. If anybody comes and will listen, I'm going to tell them, I believe homeschooling is the best way. I've seen the fruit. I know the price that we pay, but I know that it's worth it. And I don't believe homeschooling saves anybody. It's not a salvation, but it's a head start. It's better than the alternative. And so whatever the sacrifice is for me as a parent, I'm willing to pay it, and I'm encouraging others to pay that price too. Um, these kids, they're world changers. This is, God has a call on the homeschool community. And these are the kids who are gonna rise up and, and change the world. They're gonna be the ones that the Lord uses in the, in the coming time, even if it's the end of the days. It's these kids who are gonna stand up and defend and share the gospel and have some kind of common sense. And man, we see a world that's like losing it. Like, like what? How'd this happen, right? I mean, when did I get so old that I forgot where common sense went? Like, I don't even know how some of this stuff is happening. We need kids who can think critically. We need kids who, who are, have the seeds of faith planted deep inside them. And in the, in the right time, at the right moment, this generation, like the bones in the, in the wilderness, are going to rise up and they are going to be a mighty army for God. I, I absolutely believe that. Okay. Hope this was helpful. Three things. Give yourself room for growth. Don't worry about perfect. Two, keep it simple. Don't get caught up in I need to have everything. Number three, get used to the noise. There's a lot of noise out there. Let it go move on. Okay, hopefully helpful, and um, if, feel free to comment, and we'll be checking comments. Facebook never did show up with questions, so we're Facebook Live. I don't know what the problem is. We They're making us use a new browser type, 
And sometimes comments come up, sometimes they don't. So I don't even know if the, if the live went. I know it went in the app. So, all right. All right, guys. Hey, God bless you. Have an awesome weekend, and we will see you next week.